people often start with, which business model should I start with? And I think that's the wrong question to start with. I think the first question we need to understand is, who are you targeting? What target market are you interested in helping? And then how might you best serve them? The business model should stem from the pains, the problems, the concerns, the inconveniences, the challenges that a particular target audience has. And so when you start there, you actually remove the guesswork because they will help guide you. And that business model then combined with uh, the problems and pains that your target audience is having is where true business success happens. Pat Flynn, welcome to Work Less, Earn More. It's so good to have you here. I'm so grateful to be here, Gillian. Thank you so much. So I know that you've labeled yourself as the crash test dummy of online business. And I think that that is such an apt description and you've really proven it out because in these past years, you have tested out so many different business models. And there's so much that can be learned from your experience with how these different business models actually played out. Because it's really easy to watch a video or read a blog post about different ways to make money online. And they just give you such a tiny snapshot. They don't give you any sort of real world experience uh, and show you how those things would actually play out in the real world. So I would love to, in this episode, just dive deep into each of these different business models that you have experimented with and talk about the pros and the cons of each one and also how time consuming and how much effort they took from you and how profitable mm. they really ended up being. Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of people, when they know that I've sort of run the gamut across all the different kinds of ways to generate an income, and all of them have in some way, shape, or form worked, I'm not saying it was perfect the whole time, and in fact, I've had a lot of failures too. You do have to fail in order to succeed uh, so you can learn and get direction. However, people often start with, which business model should I start with? And I think that's the wrong question to start with. I think the first question we need to understand is, who are you targeting? What target market are you interested in helping? And then how might you best serve them? The business model should stem from the pains, the problems, the concerns, the inconveniences, the challenges that a particular target audience has. And so when you start there, you actually remove the guesswork because they will help guide you. And that business model then combined with uh, the problems and pains that your target audience is having is where true business success happens. Absolutely. Well, I couldn't agree more, but I do have a question for you. And that is, did you take your own advice with your first business model that you tried out? Did you jump into a business model first or did you start with an audience? And what was that business model? I, I started with an audience. In fact, this audience was made up of people who were studying for a very very specific exam in the architecture industry. I actually was an architect, I had gotten laid off. And my first foray into internet business was helping people pass an architectural exam called the LEED exam, L-E-E-D, which stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. And I knew that I wanted to just connect with people first, right? So I had built a website, it was at inthelead.com, uh, later changed because I later found out that you're not supposed to use a trademark in a domain name. I, I, again, I didn't know what I was doing, I was just doing what I could to help this audience. But most of my audience, in fact, came from getting involved in forums. So there were a lot of architecture forums where people were asking questions about this exam, and I just showed up daily, sometimes three to four hours a day, to connect and, and, and provide value and in a relatively short period of time, I started noticing that people started to come to me for help and people started actually recommending that they wait till I sign on to get questions answered and such. Uh, and then with a little signature at the bottom of my name, people would always come back to my website to learn more. And so the cool thing was that the, that audience in fact told me that they wanted to go deeper. And that's when then I discovered that I, I could just write a PDF guide and sell my own information that is structured in a way that could best serve this audience. And that was my first business model was actually building a physical product, or excuse me, a digital product, uh, just a Word document that was exported as a PDF and then selling it online. And it did, it did extremely well, but it was definitely audience uh, driven. And I think that's the best way to approach it, even though it takes a little bit longer and it's not the only way to do it. Uh, you remove the guesswork when you listen to your audience and build something for them. So that first business model was essentially just selling a really simple digital product. And mm -hmm. I'm curious to know, what were some of the biggest pros with that business model? What worked really well about it? So the nice thing about a digital product uh, is definitely the fact that it's digital, right? So after it's created, it could essentially be copied and sold again, again, and again, and again. I purposefully did not 
actually print out this book. So it's just like a study guide, right? This is what it was. It had practice exams in it. It had information and charts and other things that could help people study and memorize certain things about this really difficult exam. And I had the choice to also print this out as a physical guide. And then I thought about it and I said, you know what? And I was very much inspired by Tim Ferriss back in the day. This was 2008. He had just written the four-hour work week, and it was like, be smart with your business. You don't have to trade your time for money. And I was like, okay, well, if I have it as digital only, my store online essentially on my website is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. It can deliver that book automatically via email as soon as a person purchases it. And I knew that this audience in particular wanted information fast, and they didn't have the ability to get this information quickly anywhere else. So that was the big selling point was get this information right now so you could study and pass this exam and save money. If I had created a physical product, I'd have to figure out where to get it printed. I'd have to then collate all those pages. I then would have to uh, sell it and then go to the post office and what if people wanted returns? It just was like, okay, let me just start with minimum viable uh, value, right? What's the minimum amount of things that I have to do to provide the most value right now? Boom, information product, digital, sold it on my website. And again, I didn't know what I was doing. I just put a link on my website and uh, a link in the sidebar of my website and just said, hey, go get the guide here. And thankfully, because I had spent a little bit of time building a reputation in this space, uh, that day that I put it up for sale uh, for $19.99, in fact. And how was it sold? It was th sold through a uh, company called eJunkie. And I think they're still around, but there's better solutions now. There's uh, Gumroad and definitely Samcart that allow you to sell these digital products. And essentially, you upload your product there. You get the button to put on your website, and people click on that button. They purchase it, and then they get it automatically delivered to them. And then you get money in your PayPal account. And all along the way, because this was my first time, I didn't, I didn't believe it was going to work. But I was driven by the fact that I had gotten laid off and needed it to work. And I had a lot of inspiration from people on the outside. Anyway, it worked easy to sell, easy to, to put on a website, uh, easy to deliver value. And uh, that first month I had made $7,908.55 from a $19.99 ebook. And then That's if incredible. I, here's the other thing. There were things that needed improvements. So instead of having to reprint the whole thing, I just updated the, the ebook and boom, it's already updated. Like that's the cool thing about digital products as well. You could change them overnight. So was it all unicorns and rainbows or were there any challenges? Uh, there were definitely a lot of challenges, you know, mostly mental challenges, getting over the fact that actually I was building something that people were buying. And I started to question whether or not it was good enough that maybe I was going to get a whole bunch of people asking for refunds, that maybe it just wasn't going to work and people were going to be upset. Uh, a lot of these sort of self-inflicted demons were going through my head. And, and, and I think that's just n natural for anybody trying something new, right? These self-doubts and this resistance, as Stephen Pressfield talks about in The War of Art. So I had to just learn to get over that. And what helped me get over that was realizing that I was actually getting results for people. That's what helped me over those mental blockages was those first few emails from people who said, Pat, you helped me pass this exam and just thank you. I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm going to spread the word about your stuff because it's just so helpful. And that was like, wow, okay, this stuff actually works. Um, another thing that was hard was, in fact, the marketing. You know, When I started to dive deeper into online business, it was like, wow, there's a whole plethora of things I could do to potentially make more sales. I could run ads. I could you know, do some retargeting. I could, you know, there's a whole bunch of things. Uh, and, and I actually avoided a lot of that because it just was too scary for me. So I just kind of kept it simple. And although I may have uh, lost some potential income, I think I kept my sanity. So as far as a business model goes, what were some of the cons that this business model had? Clearly it had a lot of pros, right? It was simple, it was streamlined, easy to scale, and it was yep. being fairly profitable. You probably had pretty low expenses at that point in time, but were there any cons perhaps related to the low price point? Yeah, the profit margins were huge, right? I mean, I, it's a digital product. Once you create it, it's kind of on autopilot at that point, which was really neat. Uh, one of the big cons was the fact that because it was digital, people started just sharing it with everybody they knew. Mm. Um, and so piracy and that kind of stuff is very, very much still around, uh, even for online courses and eBooks and this kind of stuff happens, but it happens with movies, it happens with all this stuff. And the, 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 what, what somebody once told me was, you know what, like those people wouldn't have become customers anyway. Uh, typically. So focus on those who you can connect with and serve and, and, and you will get rewarded for, for providing value. So, you know, when it comes down to it, the digital products, fairly simple, but the, the, 
you could only charge so much for an ebook, right? And and I think that's mm-hmm. where you limit yourself in terms of what's possible because there are ways to provide a lot more value and get a lot more money back. So let's move on and talk about one of the next business models that you experimented with. What was the next one? The next one was affiliate marketing. And affiliate marketing is the idea that you can recommend a product to your audience. And if you recommend it through a specific link called an affiliate link, which you get from the company that you're providing uh, some help for, um, you get a commission, essentially. You know, this is different than sponsorships and advertising, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, which is they're going to give you a flat fee up front and then you just promote it and hopefully traffic comes in. This is rather a beautiful strategy because companies aren't losing anything. They only pay you when they get new customers. And that's the beauty of it from a company's perspective. And the beauty of it for you and the pro, the huge pro, is that you don't have to spend the time to create your own products, right? That, that That's another con of creating your own stuff is just it takes time to do that right. Mm-hmm. And there are businesses, there are companies, there are products out there that you could probably promote today that already exist, that are already of service to your audience that you can just get behind. And if you make a connection or partner with that company, uh, it can be pretty prosperous for you as it's been for me. And the first product that I promoted as an affiliate was for this architecture audience that I had built. And so I was selling my own my own study guide. But there was also another company out there that created a online practice exam simulator. And this test, when you took it, it was actually on a computer. So they had the advantage of having a very lifelike exam experience for this particular exam. So I actually used that to help myself study. And uh, I reached out to them and I said, hey, you know, I'd love to help promote your stuff. And they were like, sure, you could, you, you know, you could run advertising, and I was like, okay, cool, that sounds interesting. And actually, that's that's what we did first. I made twenty five dollars a month posting a hundred and fifty by hundred and fifty pixel image on my website, and I was like, yo, this is like free money, twenty five bucks a month. But here's the thing: I discovered affiliate marketing, and I said, hey, do you have an affiliate program? And they said, yeah, we sure do. Would you like to sign up? And I said, yes. And they said, okay, here are the terms. The, uh, you know, our product is ninety nine dollars. We'll give you twenty one dollars for every person you sign you sign up. And I was like, wow. If I just get one person to sign up, that's like the same as what we were doing with the advertising thing. The first month that I did affiliate marketing for this company, I had 100 people come through. 100 people came through at $21. So I made $2,100 that month from promoting A little a more than 25, right? Or, <laughs> yeah, a little, a little more than $25. And not only was I making additional income on top of the product that I already had, because it was a perfect complementary product, I was getting people sending me emails thanking me for introducing them to a product that actually was of service to them. Like they were like, wow, this was the, like gold that you shared this for me. Thank you. And of course, I had an affiliate link and I disclosed that there was an affiliate relationship. So people were going out of their way to make sure they were clicking my affiliate link. And that's something you have to do with affiliate marketing is you have to disclose that affiliate relationship. That's FTC regulations. Yeah. So clearly some huge advantages to this business model. You get to share valuable products with your audience. You don't have to take the time to create the product. You don't have to have the infrastructure in your business to deliver the product, which I think Mm -hmm. is huge. But were there any challenges? What are some of the cons of this affiliate marketing business model? Yeah, and this stems to why affiliate marketing has a little bit of a negative connotation, and it's because people take advantage of how easy this business model is, meaning many people will choose a product just because it has a really high commission and then kind of ram it down their audience's throat. They're going to send email after email. They're going to put it all over the place because they know they're going to get a good commission. But the trouble is because it's not your own product, you have to be very, very careful because if that company doesn't do justice, if if that company uh, doesn't serve that person, sure, that person that is your audience member is going to be upset at that company. But guess whose recommendation uh, they're Mm -hmm. never going to take again? Guess whose product they're never going to buy? Yours. So you have to spend some time making sure that you promote the right products. And there were moments uh, in the later years where I was promoting things that I probably shouldn't have promoted. And as a result of that, people, you know, I lost their trust uh, for a little bit. And and, and that was a big eye opener because your reputation is everything online, of course. So affiliate marketing can be absolutely amazing. But uh, another con is it, it can be difficult to wrap your head around the fact that you still have to sell this product, right? I think affiliate marketing, again, because it's so simple, we often go, oh, I'll just send an email and pull, put a link on my web, web website or resource page and that'll be it. But if you just do that, again, because it's not your product, 
people aren't going to trust that recommendation right off the bat often. I mean some people will because they trust you, but you have to perhaps work a little bit harder to get people to understand why this product is something they need and how it's going to serve and help them. Uh, the best way to do that would be to show your own experience using that product. Don't just share the product or po post a link for it. Tell the story about how you use this product and how it's helped you and, and what you like about it, what you don't like about it. Like just be honest and upfront with it. And this is where I think people who are on YouTube, for example, have a huge advantage because you can show video of yourself using this. And that's what people want. They just want security in their mind that, okay, when they purchase this product that it's actually gonna benefit them uh, and, and actually be useful. And so uh, it can take a little bit more work to promote an affiliate product than your own product if you have an audience because it's not yours. But even as a podcaster, per se, you have the idea of maybe bringing on the founder of that company owner onto your show and interviewing them. Uh, I did this with ConvertKit, which is an email service provider that I am an affiliate for. I brought the founder, Nathan Berry, onto the show, and we didn't talk about how awesome the product was. We didn't talk about why people should get ConvertKit. We told the story of ConvertKit and how it bootstrapped and how it came to be and why it's built in, in, in the way it is. And that episode, even though it was created – six, seven years ago, still continues to bring new affiliate sales every single day. And in fact, this is an, a, a holy grail type of affiliate sale because it is a recurring income for mm -hmm. every customer that comes through. So that's like, you can promote a product one off and get paid that one time, or you can promote something like software, typically software has this, where you can get paid a recurring income every single month from the customers that you bring through. So I get a five figure check from ConvertKit every single month from people that I've uh, recommended it to years ago. And then next month I'll have more people, and next month I have more people, and it just can continue to stack. Uh, and and that's, that's like the best kind of affiliate marketing. Yeah, absolutely. And I listened to that episode when it came out, actually, and it got me, and I signed up for ConvertKit. No way. And I've been a, a loyal ConvertKit member ever since. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's been a huge <laughs> asset to my business as well. Good. So talk to me a little bit about, with affiliate marketing, the relationship between how much time you've personally had to invest into affiliate marketing and how profitable it's been for you. Yeah, it's a very, very high, uh, high ROI for mm -hmm. sure. But the ROI comes from you doing a service for your audience. And you have to think about it that way. Your service to your audience with affiliate marketing. Affiliate marketing can seem very, oh, well, I'm just doing this for me. I'm making the commission for me. It doesn't really, you know, I'm just trying to make more money. Sure, you're going to make money. But when you approach affiliate marketing with, I'm going to help filter all the noise out there. I'm going to help find just the best products and the right products to recommend to my audience then you're actually doing them a service. You're helping save them time and you're helping them understand what is actually gonna work for them or not. You know, I have a lot of people come to me and go, Pat, I have like three different options I could offer for people for this challenge they have. Should I offer all three or should I just pick one? And I always say pick the one because your job is to help make decision making easier for your audience. And if you go, hey, there are three things that you can get and they're all great. Well, you're not actually helping your audience. You might actually give them uh, you know, analysis paralysis at that point. So step up, make the decision. And the cool thing about this is you can take this even one step further. When you make that decision to promote a singular product and you share that product with your audience and then it provides some volume for them, likely they're gonna reach out to you or if not, you reach out to them and say, hey, what else can we do together? You might get early access to things because you've been an affiliate. You might be able to command a higher commission than what normal people get. You might even be able to come on board as an advisor to the company, which is what's happened to me because of the work that you're doing to help and serve them. I'm an advisor now to uh, ConvertKit and Samcart and Teachable and so many other amazing businesses, Circle, uh, because of first that affiliate relationship that happened. And, and that's really cool because now I have a, a, you know part ownership of the company as a result of this. It, like It can go really, really far. That's awesome. Okay, so to the next business model that you tried out, which I believe was writing and selling books. Explain to me how that works as a business model. Yeah, so books are interesting because you might go, oh, well, isn't that the same as selling like a digital product? Um, and, and no, the only difference is not just the fact that it can also be a physical product and also an audio book. Uh, but a book, in my opinion, is an amazing first step that people can take with your entire business journey or the journey that you wanna take people on, right? So for example, I wrote a book called Will It Fly? And Will It Fly was written in 2015 to help answer that question of how do I validate this business idea I have? How do I make sure I'm not wasting my time and, and, and money? But it's not just the book. The book leads people into an email list 
through a free companion course. And that email list then drives people into sales for some of the other courses that I have. So not only am I helping people understand what business model works for them through my book, Will It Fly? I can help with their next steps after that. And mm -hmm. so if you have a book or you're thinking about writing a book, think about, okay, well, what's next after the book? What comes after that? And when you can create the book with that in mind, it can really help a person get into your ecosystem because books, people consume lots of books in all different kinds of ways. Then they can get introduced to your style and you and what you have to offer and then push them into another business model. So books, yes, are making money. In fact, the audiobook is making more money than the physical and the Kindle uh, versions combined, which is really interesting but that's just the first step in the process and can lead people into the other business models too the hard thing about a book though is it's a book it's it feels very heavy in terms of the production of it but once mm -hmm. it's there i mean it, this book is still selling off the shelves and is still introducing people in a more automated fashion so it's a lot of time investment up front but for some amazing things if you integrate it into the rest of your business later yeah, I experienced this myself as well when I wrote a book a few years ago that wasn't related to the topic of my business or the audience I was building with my business. And I didn't even intend for this book to have anything to do with a business venture. It was just a personal project. Uh -huh. But it almost accidentally launched a business without me even trying in that I launched the book. It took off, it got a lot of sales in the first few months especially, and it grew an email list overnight <laughs> just from the book. And then immediately, these people started wanting a product and I started creating a product and then I was like wait wait no this isn't the business I want to build and I backed up I love how you pointed out um, that it's not about like that 15 or 20 dollar book sale that's not the end of how this business model works out you can end up selling much you know products at higher price points products that will help your audience a lot more down the road and this can just be kind of like the beginning of your funnel essentially exactly Exactly. So clearly there are some really interesting benefits of this business model. Um, let's talk about any cons. I guess you touched on one that writing a book can be hard, right? It can feel overwhelming. Were there any other major cons to the business model of writing and selling books? You know, I got lucky in, in the fact that the books that I wrote are pretty evergreen in terms of nature and, and how they work. Uh, there are many books out there that if you imagine a Facebook advertising book, you publish that next month it's going to be out of date and so you got to you got to be careful about the topics that you write about because you can have a book that's out of date very very quickly and have wasted that time and so that that, that could be a potential con that people can run into it's uh you know if it's e if it's an ebook only then it's a little bit easier but uh i think people still prefer many in many cases the physical book and then also the audio book to go along with it um the other con is that you know it's just not going to make a ton of money you know i think a lot of people hype up the book idea and say you can make a lot of money with books i think there's more money to be made by connecting your book to like we've mm -hmm. been talking about these other business models for sure so um and and then you know the book marketplace is very crowded it can be very difficult to compete with the other books that are out there. So this is why, obviously, it benefits if you have an audience already. But if you uh, nail your keywords, if you have a really good Amazon sales page, and if you you know even get a little bit lucky, uh, maybe you go on a podcasting guest uh, podcasting you know uh, run or something like that to get the word out there. But um, you know Amazon can help you for sure, or it could just bury you. Like it, you, you just mm -hmm. are not going to exist on the on the platform. <laughs> um, so that, that those are some. And that platform, Amazon, learning about that is 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 hard. It's 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 its own language, if you will. Um, so that could be a, a con or a difficulty for sure. Yeah, yeah. So just standing out in the crowd of all the books, I think mm -hmm. it can be a little bit more difficult to differentiate a book as a product than something that is a physical product or just a, a more expensive product, perhaps. A book exactly. looks the same as all the other books. Very true. And how has this played out for you in terms of the time spent versus the profitability? You know, it's hard because I'm actually in the middle of writing another one right now. <laughs> and it's just like, oh, my gosh, it's like I forgot how hard this was. So, you know, maybe if you ask me again after this book is done, I'll say something different. But uh, it's, it's definitely a lot of work up front to create a really outstanding book, one that, uh, you know, hopefully people will spread out for you. Um, that's that's kind of the approach that I take. I want these books to be read and then have people share what they're learning with others to have them get interested in the book too. But, you know, your book doesn't have to be very long. It doesn't have to be a 300, 400 page book. It could be a small little guide and, and, and it could perfectly insert itself in, into your business and do a lot. And, and I think that, you know, looking back, the ROI is definitely there, uh, but it takes time for it to catch up with, with the amount of time that you put in up front. 
Yeah, it's a more big picture strategy, especially yeah, how you were talking about how you could uh, tie it into other products that you're selling. So can you give us any spoilers, any hints about what the new book is about? Or is this top secret information? Uh, I can give you a spoiler. Yeah, it's it's about learning uh, and learning efficiently. I think a lot of us suffer from content bloat these days and don't allow mm -hmm. us, ourselves a lot of time to actually execute. So it's going to be about that and, and different strategies I use to, as you could tell, I do a lot of things. And a lot of people ask me, how are you able to manage and find the time to do all these things? This book essentially answers that question. Yeah. Is this related to your, I think you call it your just in time philosophy? Yes. Just in time learning, which is only allowing yourself to learn about and consume information about the next step on your roadmap. And it just puts the blinders on. It helps you stay in your lane and, and it helps you feel more accomplished. Awesome. Well, I'll look forward to seeing that on shelves in bookstores. <laughs> well, at Gary. least on Amazon very soon. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. It might be my first traditionally published book. And that's, yeah. that's sort of the second side of this model, right? We like I think what we were talking about was maybe more of a self published model, which is something you have a little bit more control over, you actually keep more of the royalties that way. But traditional, uh, working with a publisher can be interesting. Uh, you know, you can make a lot of money up front through a advance. Uh, potentially and you know you get some distribution so you can actually get into bookstores but that essentially is ma mainly for clout uh, versus income uh, yeah and, uh, again no matter what though think about your book as a part of your business not the business yes so let's move on and talk about how speaking has worked for you as a business model I'm really curious to know what your experience with this has been and whether this has been very profitable especially in terms of the time spent on it so tell me about speaking yeah there's a lot of people that are full-time speakers I'm not a full-time speaker but their business model is presenting at various conferences or in front of various businesses and I wanted to get on stage early on to just experiment with it to see if I could do it, number one, more of a personal thing. But number two, I knew it was going to be a great way to force myself to craft my positioning and my messages in a way that could affect people. And especially in person, there's no better way to make a difference or make an impact than in person. So uh, there were a lot of conferences in the internet business space that I knew I had a lot of value to share uh, on or at. And so I started speaking in 2011 for free. And it was more of a way similar to the book to get in front of audiences and then have them understand who I was and then drive them into other things that I have in my business. So capturing leads on stage is a very important thing. And you know, I don't do any selling on stage, although I have done that once and it was very successful. It's just not something I wanna do. Uh, the, the, the kind of ones where you sell something and people rush to the back and they <laughs> fill out their forms, like that's just not my cup of tea. Uh, however, over time, after I have gotten really excited about speaking and honing in on my craft and finding mentors in that space, uh, I've gotten to the point where now I can get paid for it. And at first it was a couple thousand dollars to speak and then it became $5,000. And then now I'm at a point where I can command twenty-five dollars to $30,000 for 60 wow. minutes of my time on stage. That's really cool. Which is really amazing, right? Like I had never thought that anybody would pay me to be on stage. You wouldn't have been able to pay me to get on stage because I was very scared. And, and that was another thing, just it forced me to get out of my comfort zone. And I always look to where my comfort zone is and I try to get one step outside of it when I uh, wanna grow in my business. So this was one way of doing that back in 2011. And since then I've spoken on hundreds of stages all around the world, I've gotten to travel. You know, It's kind of cool because they'll sometimes, if you're a keynote especially, pay for your travel. I, I was even able to negotiate one time a trip to Australia for my family as a result of the sort of payment fee uh and and so we took a family vacation to australia because i was speaking at a keynote there at pro blogger anyway it's just been super fun uh and so yeah good money coming in but at the same time i will say that even though it's for 60 minutes of stage time it's definitely way more than 60 minutes of time that's required because there's time leading up to the event to craft that speech and, and that talk that for me at least provides a lot of anxiety and weight and pressure uh, and then it's the day of travel there, which takes out a lot of you, and, and, and it takes a lot out of you. And then when you're at these conferences, you have to be on it, which for me as an intro introvert is very draining. And then there's all the talking, and then sometimes you know you come back and you need a couple days to recover. So if I was a full-time speaker and I didn't have a family and I didn't have anything to worry about at home, I can imagine doing that and having that be a very viable business model. It's really fun too. And you get to meet so many people. That's one of the benefits of speaking is you get to meet other speakers in the green room. I got to meet people like Casey Neistat and, and other people in, in, in spaces like that. Uh, however, um, it definitely is very draining. And I think that I am 
I know that I'm actually slowing down my speaking. Um, I used to do it like once or twice a month, and now it's going to be once or twice a year. It's just it just takes a, a, a lot out of you. So something that I know you've done a whole lot of is podcasting and also YouTube. Um, and the primary way you're making money with those things is going to be sponsorships. And then, of course, with YouTube, we've also got this ad revenue. But let's talk about the sponsorship business model um, yeah. and how that relates to podcasting and YouTube and the pros and cons of that. Sure. When you have an audience, there are likely going to be companies who will pay you to get in front of that audience and have you share something about it or talk about it for a little bit. And that can be done in many ways. On a podcast especially, it is going to be perhaps a pre-roll, which is a little bit of about that company right before the show starts, a mid-roll, which is in the middle, and then an, uh, a post-roll at the end. And, and the cool thing about a podcast is it's you can structure it in any way you want. You can create a contract with that company, and, and typically you can get paid anywhere between 15 to 50 dollars CPM, and that's cost per milli or cost per thousand uh, downloads. So if you get 10,000 downloads a month and you get paid 25,000, uh, or if, 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 you, if uh, excuse me, if you get 10,000 downloads a month and you get $25 per thousand, you know, you have 250 bucks, which is pretty cool for uh, episodes that you do for a, a little bit of a uh, mention about, about that product on the show. Uh, and this has been something that's become very profitable, especially as the audience on the podcast has grown to the uh, hundreds of thousands, and you know we can get uh, paid anywhere between three to sometimes upwards of ten to twelve thousand dollars per episode, which is pretty amazing. Now it's not consistent because sometimes these contracts end, sometimes people just want one episode, sometimes people want uh, longer, and, and we often give them deals if, if it's longer. Um, we are now working with an agency to help us sell these spots, which makes it a lot easier. Although we now have to share some of those profits. Um, now we don't have to worry about actually finding the people to advertise on our show. So there's a lot of different ways to go about it. And, and the, the, the pro is you're going to create these episodes anyway, and your audience, especially if you only promote products that really serve your audience, it could be a win for them too. I've had people thank me for some of the advertisements on my podcast, which is pretty cool. Uh, so you have to kind of draw that line where you want to draw it because you could promote dog food on a cat podcast if you wanted to just to make money, but maybe you might not want to do that, right? Um, and then – you know, you have to be careful because many people will go, oh, here's another ad. And, you know, as long as you're coming from a place of service and as long as your episodes are, are worth it, that's great. And I think that that income can help you lean into serving your audience even more, right? Uh, the con about this is it's not always steady. It is something that requires a lot of work to go and find and create these deals. And, and, and oftentimes for sponsorships and advertising, you need a certain number of subscribers. That number is not a specific number, but it's you need a sizable audience that an, uh, a tar uh, an advertiser would be interested in. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say you only if you only have a thousand downloads per month, you can't do this because you can, maybe you have a great relationship with the product and you have just in general, a small audience that that's possible but you own that audience right like you are the go-to podcast for those people well then you can command a higher price point and then you could also combine it with things like your email list or um, a link or an image on your website right to to add more to the to the to the overall package for people but yeah that's that's how it works on the podcasting front and on youtube of course uh you know you can do sponsorships and brand deals as well very similarly uh, but then you also get the benefit of having uh, some ad revenue come in as well, which which I've seen grow over time. But both of those things, like it, it, as soon as you stop doing those things, you're gonna you're gonna see lower revenue, right? It's not necessarily as uh, evergreen, if you will, as some of the other business models potentially. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on getting paid to promote other people's products versus using that space to promote your own products? I think that you could do both. Uh, but you have to be very careful about how you do that. We we do both. You know, we have our own products that could serve our audience, but we also share products from others that could also serve our audience. And again, as long as you have that audience solution driven uh, perspective in mind, then you should be okay. Uh, but you know, be aware that you can talk a lot about other people's stuff and forget to talk about your own stuff, or you could talk too much about products that are advertising stuff that you don't even get to the meat of your content. And on YouTube especially, you gotta be careful because people's attention spans are very, very short on YouTube, as, as you know. Um, so yeah, I think you could do both. Uh, or you can flip-flop. Maybe one episode you promote your own stuff and another episode you promote somebody else's stuff. Uh, and, and that's totally fine too. Um, mixing it up, in fact, is, is a great strategy so people aren't just oblivious to the same old message each time.
So clearly this is another case where at the beginning, it's not going to be very profitable. It's going to be a lot of time spent, for example, creating the content uh, and very little profit coming in. And then later as your audience grows, it can be quite profitable. So now I know that you've done a lot with selling courses online, both with evergreen self-paced type courses, and also now you've been focusing more on live cohort based courses. What has been your experience with each of these business models? And maybe you could compare and contrast them. Sure. So the evergreen or DIY course is something that we're all very familiar with, right? This isn't anything new, um, but I was new to it in 2017. And um, the reason it took so long for me to actually create a course, even though people wanted more information from me, right? And that information wasn't really right for a book and it wasn't really something that I wanted to do one-on-one. -on -one. So uh, I, I had thought I was just like, you know, affiliate marketing is good. I'm going to promote other people's stuff. You know, I'm going to, uh, people wanted a podcasting course for me. And I said, you know what? Go check out John Lee Dumas's podcast course, or go check out Cliff Ravenscraft podcast course because they already have one. Like I don't, I don't need to create another one. But people kept asking, "No, we want it from you, Pat. We want it from you and your style, and we know that you can make it even more efficient." And 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 I knew that was true, but I was just maybe a little bit reluctant or scared until finally in 2017 we launched a course called Power Up Podcasting. And the cool thing about this and and the way that we launch all of our courses is we run it through a beta group first where the course isn't even fully made yet. We are making it with those people. And this is what makes this very simple to understand. So number one, if you understand that there's a pain or a problem or something that you can transform your audience with, a transformation that they want, then you can go, okay, instead of building the course and then selling it and then hoping, let's run a little beta group. And you can actually have similarly a cohort-based style to start so that you can actually connect with those people, make sure that all the holes are filled, you can actually coach them along the way and get some results, and then you're creating these videos to help them along the way, and so that by the end of six, eight weeks, however long it might take, they now have finished the course, you now have finished recording the course, it's already created now, and not only that, now you have A, proven results that give you the confidence to finally then sell this thing, because you know it works, and that's absolutely key, but number two, you have now testimonials of people mm -hmm. who have gone through the course. And so this is the business model I teach in Will It Fly is to, number one, understand what the pains and problems are of your audience, really chat with them, understand the language they use, understand that fully. And then if the solution is something like an online course, don't just create the online course first. Build it out with a select group of people, even if it's like two or three people. Have them actually pay for it if possible, because then that is true validation, right? but they get special treatment, they get all of you, they get access to you, they get accountability, and you're gonna help walk them through the however many weeks it takes, and you just have to deliver a video or a set of videos once a week as they go through it, they do the homework, you, you chat with them, maybe they're in a Facebook group or something. Uh, so a lot of work up front to make sure that what you're building is something that's going to be amazing and last and also be able to be repeatedly sold uh, over time. And so the beauty of having an evergreen course is once it's done, it's done. And then all you need to do is focus on top of funnel. So let's get people into our email list, whether it's from a book or a podcast or a website. And then from that funnel, you can let people know that this course exists and uh, you can even evergreen the whole thing where they get put into an email list where they then they get pitched this two weeks later after you provided them some value. Um, the way that we launch our courses, however, is not in an evergreen fashion with email, but our evergreen courses are sold uh, a few times a year. So we'll run, for example, a, a high-level training webinar where we bring people on, which is high-touch, high-value, really demonstrating uh, the, the kind of teaching that I do, and then lead people into the course after that should they be interested in it. And that has worked, and that has provided $4.4 .4 million of sales since 2017, and, and online courses have been the, the backbone of our business since then. It's, it's been really amazing. Uh, lately, though, we've been noticing that a lot of people who are taking our courses um, – prefer to get some help along the way. So they want access to uh, instructors or coaches, um, which yes, you can command a higher price point for that, which is really amazing. Uh, but it takes a lot more work because it's a little bit more manual with that particular group of people. So instead of coaching one person through it, we'll coach several people through it. Our latest uh, cohort was for our course Power Up Podcasting, which there is a digital version of that. So we're not creating anything new. We're just creating a curriculum around the pre-existing DIY course, and that was an eight-week program. We ran 50 people through it, 
and it has like a 95% completion rate, which is really amazing. This is this just shows you the difference because digital courses typically have a much, much lower completion rate. Uh, and half of the students who came into the cohort were people who purchased the digital course and were like, yeah, I just never had time to do it. Now I'm going to do it, and, 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 and you've given me structure now. You've given me accountability. And not only that, people in the group help and, and, and uh, serve each other, right? They get into their little breakout groups and the Zoom calls every Thursday, and they're uh, – providing feedback and getting feedback uh, all at once. And then we have, yesterday was our graduation actually. We had people show up and share their artwork, share their show title, share like their first episodes. And it was just such a huge celebration. And now they wanna stay in the ecosystem more. They're joining our membership program and they wanna stick around. And so um, the cohort based stuff, even though it is a lot more work, it's definitely a lot more successful in terms of the students and you can charge a lot more for it but it's definitely not an automated thing. Yeah, well, that's really interesting and really cool. And I've been experiencing something really similar with my courses. In the past, I would create these courses ahead of time, and then I yep. would sell them as self-paced courses. And then I merged, I switched to instead doing that sort of live first run of the course, yeah. like you're talking about a beta run where I was creating the course and at the same time having people go through it and coaching them along the way because I wanted to make sure I was creating the thing that would really serve the people the best was really what they needed and what they wanted and then through doing that i loved that experience so much and i loved especially like you were talking about how so many more of the students actually finished the course and actually got results and so now i've been doing that on repeat with so many of the courses that were originally nice. intended to be self-paced so i've experienced something really similar myself and you mentioned that it's earned you over four million dollars i'm curious is online are online courses the thing that have generated the most revenue for your business or is there any other business model that's generated more uh online courses and affiliate sales are pretty comparable but that's mostly because affiliate sales were the only thing providing an income for years. I mean, remember the um, information product for my architecture exam site? Um, I actually stopped updating that. I removed my own product from the website and I just replaced it with the practice exam company stuff because they created their own guides too and they're more likely to keep it up to date than I am. Mm -hmm. So that's just driving affiliate sales now. So most of my sales in the beginning were coming through affiliate sales for six, seven years. Then I created online courses and that has been uh, doing amazing. Uh, and then now the cohort based stuff on top of that, which is which is really cool. Um, the the other interesting thing about the latest cohort, those fifty people, I wasn't involved. My team led the whole thing, and um, they're just kind of using my curriculum from the DIY course to to support that. Uh, and that was the first time we did one where I was removed from the teaching, mm -hmm. and it worked out well. There was no like, well, where's Pat? I signed up for Pat. No, people buy courses to buy the transformation. Right, they they want the transformation, and if like honestly, my team did such an amazing job, and it just is pretty cool because now I can scale it. Maybe we want to run multiple cohorts at the same time. Okay, let's just get more amazing coaches that can help hold people accountable because the information is all there in the course, mm -hmm. but the person and the guidance and the the space to collaborate is 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 really what the the big idea is behind the cohort stuff, uh, and it truly makes amazing results. Yeah. Now, obviously, that reduces the time and effort that you have to put into it if you're not doing the coaching yourself. But I imagine there's still more effort required on your part yep. than if it was a self-paced course because you For still sure. have to manage the people. For sure. And, and and I still show up in the beginning to welcome people and I show up at the at the end and then I pop in in the middle at some point. But yeah, it's it's not all it's not completely hands off. Um, yeah. No matter what. I mean, nothing is. I mean, you still have to upkeep everything. But uh, the DOI course especially if you can get an evergreen funnel going is probably the, the going to be the highest ROI once that thing is set. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, as with all of these different business models we've been discussing, there are pros and cons of each of them. And with the cohort based courses, obviously you have this huge pro of mm -hmm. higher student success, that the students love it more, that they are going to send more people back to you via word of mouth. You'll have yep. more amazing testimonials. You can, like you said, command a higher price point, but then you have the con of it does take more time and more effort on your part. So right. I think there are two more business models that we're going to get through here. And so the next one is coaching. I know you've done some coaching. What has been your experience with this business model? 
Yeah, so I did group coaching for a while, and this was what was called the SPI Accelerator Program. I noticed that there were certain segments of my audience that just were not being served. It was the higher level business owner, the six figure business owner who just wasn't really getting value from the content that I was publishing on my podcast and website anymore because they've sort of graduated from that level. But I wanted to continue to serve them, and I, I knew that at that level, because I'm at that level myself, it's like, well, there's a, there's different kinds of problems that show up and different things that maybe you know aren't going to be useful to write on the blog. But I'd much rather work with you through that. So we created a group coaching program called the SPI Accelerator Program, where I charged twenty thousand dollars for an entire year of group coaching. And what that meant was two or three times a year we were going to all meet together in San Diego, like mastermind we rented out this house in in la jolla california like a giant home everybody had their own room but then we come together all day every person would have time in their hot seat to uh, show something they were doing we could break it down and build it back up and it was just such an amazing thing because th these people all became family right and we had group calls every week and individual coaching calls once every quarter to help people go in the right direction but it was really about the group serving the group and myself facilitating that and also helping uh, with the guidance and it was truly amazing it was it was epic for two years um and we were going to continue to do it but then COVID hit <laughs> right and so f in terms of size like this is like 10 people so 10 people times 20 i mean that's two hundred thousand dollars for coaching 10 people uh, and and having really fun experiences with them and really seeing some amazing breakthroughs because a lot of the, like a lot of this was like mental stuff actually it was it felt very therapeutic I think and and, and so COVID hit and it was like oh well the group thing isn't going to work because a big play in this was meeting together in person and creating that family aspect and you know we were all getting tired of zoom calls so I stopped doing the accelerated program in that way however a lot of those students were like well we still want help from you Pat like is there anything you can do to help help us still and so I decided to create a much more simple coaching style program where it was now one-on-one -on -one. so one-on-one -on -one coaching which is definitely not scalable but it's also I can get a lot deeper with every individual so I had eight of those students still continue to want to work with me in a way where I chat with them for 30 minutes every week they pay me a set amount of money every single month to just get on a phone call with me 30 minutes every single week and that's it uh, that's it there's no group group, group calls there's no in-person meetings promised or anything like that it's just 30 minutes a week whatever you want to bring to the table let's talk about it and it's my job at that point to have them walk away from those calls with like yes or, or finally or yes that's exactly what I need like the ROI hopefully is there for them and it is or else they would have gone already uh, but I've been doing that for about a year now and it's been very rewarding although it's definitely you know that's like an that's like 30 minutes in my calendar for a single person every single week times eight and so there is a day of the week where it's just like a call after call after call and I enjoy it but it's definitely you know I feel like you know that time could be potentially used elsewhere I'm I'm, mm -hmm. I'm I'm dedicated to my students I'm not going to change it right now and, and that was the whole idea of the group coaching thing in the first place was I could take care of more people in less time um, but then of course COVID hit like I said and the pandemic stopped that so I enjoy the one-on-one -on -one and many many people thrive on that and, and love it and many people that's their primary and only business model they go from book to one-on-one -on -one coaching right uh, and and that's really amazing but it's it's definitely um, I have to be on it. That's the other thing. Like when I show up to a call, um, it would be a disservice if I wasn't fully there or mm -hmm. if my head was elsewhere. Yeah. So on the one hand, it sounds like even though you do have to be engaged the whole time, it is a lot less effort than something like creating a course or writing a book, right? Um, right. It's, it's easier, but you have to keep showing up every single week and being engaged, unlike with the book or with a course where you get to kind of do this big effort and then sit back and get a break. Exactly, exactly. So I think that probably comes down, you know, which of those business models is quote better would come down more to someone's personality than anything exactly. and the type of work that they thrive on. Exactly. Like what's what's your style? And, and, and that's really important to understand. Like, who are you? And which type of, uh, of business models would you best thrive in? So let's talk about one last business model before we wrap that up, and that is memberships. What has been your experience yeah. with memberships? And tell me the pros and the cons. The, the membership model is really amazing. In 2019, I held a conference in San Diego, and it, it, it was absolutely incredible. And the most incredible thing was not the stage talks and things like that. It was actually the conversations that people were talking about in the hallways. And that's what I love about conferences the most. I mean, you could probably relate to this too. The connections that are made, the conversations, the, the just like it's amazing. Um, 
And then 2020 hit, and the conference was supposed to happen again, and of course it wasn't able to. And then it was delayed again, and it's sort of basically canceled now. But I really miss uh, that ability to give people space to meet each other in that way, to communicate with each other. And so my team and I, we actually had an idea for this that was going to be more of a 2022-2023 thing, but we pulled it forward into 2020 because of this need to connect. And everybody was feeling very lonely in their homes and wanting to connect. Nobody was going to conferences anymore at all. So we created SPI Pro which is our premium membership program. You do have to apply to it, but everybody who's in there is a business owner and has the same kind of needs, wants, and and desire to help bring better things to the internet and, and, and better the world in that way. And we launched in July of 2020, and we had 500 people come in. And this is a recurring income business model. It's $49 a month or $499 a year. And every single quarter, we let a new set of students in or, or, or a new cohort in, if you will. Um, and it's really taken off. It's become an incredible, thriving community outside of Facebook, outside of LinkedIn, outside of those places. It's a community membership platform that we own. And it feels good because it's its own entity now. And it, it of itself is very profitable, right? We spend money on staffing it and, and, and the systems, but we make way more money back from that. If you were like just segment out just the SPI Pro membership community alone, it's profitable and it's going to be more profitable even down the road. So we're using a platform called Circle to manage that, circle.so. I'm an advisor to that company now because I've loved it so much and it allows us to have this really beautiful Facebook group-like experience with the conversational organization of Slack all in one spot. And what's cool about this is we're connecting people with each other. This is not a content play. People are not coming in here to get more content. In fact, we ran a survey. It was like, what do you want out of SPA Pro? Content was the last thing people wanted. What they wanted was network. What they wanted was connection. And what they wanted was some guidance and accountability. And we're able to serve them through SPI Pro. And what happens in there is they are placed into a mastermind. They are also uh, participants in events, challenges. We have a, a COTM or a challenge of the month uh, where we expand their horizons a little bit with some some things that test them. Uh, there's AMAs with experts and myself in there. And it just be, it's, it's just like we've never had such incredible testimonials ever than the people we get in there. And I think it's because it's, it's, people want to feel like they belong to something and they can connect with people just like them. And this is the space to do that. How much of your time would you say you're spending on this program every month? A couple hours a week in there to just participate. And once a month doing a two-hour AMA and mm-hmm. just having direct messages with people in there. So I would say on average two to three hours a week is all. Again, very similar to all the all these other business models Some upfront work, really Mm -hmm. important, some investment, but we're getting paid back uh, by the load. Um, And we get a direct connection to our audience now, and it's people. And that's the cool thing because a lot of these other business models, right, creating an online course, it's DIY, uh, writing a book, uh, advertising and sponsorships. Like, sure, you can make money with it, but you don't really have a direct connection to who it is that you're serving in that moment or, or with that transaction. But here we are, we have a member who comes in and they share a bit about themselves and we can connect them with somebody who can help them and they see results and they share the wins and they get spotlit in the, the membership spotlight uh, light every single week. And it's just like, this is like a, like a, like a 24 seven conference hallway that's happening all the time now. And it's just, it's just beautiful. So the con is that if, if, if it's not a populated community up front, it's going gonna, it's gonna to feel like a ghost town. You need mm-hmm. to have some sort of audience already. And maybe you build that audience and community on Facebook first or LinkedIn or something and then bring them over. But if you just create a community and try to sell people into it, even if you get a couple people in there, it's going to be like, okay, well, there's yeah. nobody here. <laughs> uh, so, that, so, so, so you have to start from an audience first uh, if you're going to build a community for sure. But it, it's, it's been one of the most fulfilling things ever. Yeah. Yeah. That was my experience as well. I knew I wanted to start a membership, but I didn't want it to be a ghost town. And so I waited for me. I think I waited until my YouTube channel was at about 50,000 subscribers and Mm -hmm. my email list probably had maybe 10,000 subscribers. And then I launched it and we were able to get, even with my audience being, for some people that would sound like a huge audience. And for other people that sounds like, well, that's tiny compared to where I am now or where you are. Right. Um, but even so we were able to get 300 members when I initially launched it a few years ago, which was incredible. That's awesome. In retrospect, I find it incredible too. It's like, how did that happen? But, um, 
and that having that initial group of members and of course it doesn't have to be 300 i would say no. if you and depending on how you structure the program it could be just a couple dozen if you're having a more intimate experience um, exactly. with them and you're uh, facilitating the conversations effectively i've got just a couple kind of wrap-up questions for you you shared sure. that um the courses and that affiliate marketing had been some of the most profitable things i assume that was in terms of gross revenue which of these things that you've done have had the highest profit margin, would you say? Uh, affiliate marketing, because there is no there is no money to be spent to do that, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's it's a hundred percent profit margin on what you earn. Uh, obviously, the products that you promote, you're going to share that revenue with the company, obviously. Um, but it, it, it's it's probably if if you're listening to this and or watching it, and you're like. Wow, what's, what 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 could I get started with right now that's going to make me the most money in the soonest amount of time? Which is like, I don't like that question, but I always get it. Um, affiliate marketing <laughs> would be the one, and, and and affiliate marketing done right, where you select the right product, focus on that, you talk about it, in, you know, in all different angles and all different ways. You create multiple videos about the same product, and you you really inject it into who you are and what you do, and you almost treat it as if it was your own product. Um, the profit margins on that are, are absolutely huge. Uh, the online courses have been amazing as well. Uh, when you can spend a little bit of time up front creating, and maybe you do invest a little bit on a production team or a camera or audio equipment or something to make it great. If, I mean, that thing just continues to, I mean, I'm, I've made a sale while we were on a call today, <laughs> right now, for an online course, one of my online courses. So that's $699. Uh, and how much of that is profit? Well, all of it, essentially. Uh, now, of course, there's, I have a business and a team and, you know, we'd have to look at the overall charts. But yeah, any, like we talked about, of these business models would work. We need to find out what works for you and combine that with, well, what would work for your audience? And mm -hmm. um, it's going to take some trial and error. But there is a lot of money to be made. It's not like a poker table where if somebody's making poker chips come their way, that means somebody else is losing poker chips. We live in this world, and it's a very abundant place. There's enough for all of us. But you have to believe it, and you have to try it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's not a zero-sum game. Okay, and then a final question here. Uh, this might be asking you to pick your favorite child because I know you said all these business models work and they've all, you know, blessed you in different ways. But I'm curious, do you have a personal favorite and why? I mean, the cohort-based model is right now my favorite because, and maybe it's just because we had graduation yesterday and there were tears had. And I mean, real emotion comes out from people who were struggling so hard and had been waiting to build a podcast, for example. I mean, we've done cohorts on other things, even email. People cry over the fact that they finally have an email list. It's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> but to see in real time a person go from, oh my gosh, I'm struggling, this is hard, to then you help them get the result that they wanted, like that's not just a transformation for them to, or to, to, to get a podcast. That's like a mental transformation for life and what's possible for them. And it's just, it's just a really amazing thing that's very inspirational and makes me want to lean more into serving my audience in that way. Well, thank you again, Pat, so much for everything that you've shared about us, about all these different business models and just being willing to put yourself on the line and do the work to test all these things out. And thank you so much for being on Work Less, Earn More today. Thank you for having me.